Good afternoon. How y'all doing? I think we're going to get started. I have a little technical difficulties, but um, that's fine. Uh, my name is Quentin Betts. Um, I'm a design associate here with the social design department, and um, I'm here to introduce our guest tonight, who will be speaking with us, uh, Sipawe and Palessa Nguyen. Um, they run the Mango Bag Township Arts Experience, and they're from South Africa. I'm going to give you a quick spill of their work. The, Man the Mango Bag Township Arts Experience is a destination development and management initiative that turns homes into townships, into galleries, and communities into creative districts. We, the initiative that turns, we, we humanly work with homeowners and families to create a warm, Im Im imitative, uh, intimate, yeah. intimate, creative environment for locals and international visitors alike. After 10 years, the Mango Bag Township Arts Experience has turned 50 homes in South African townships into galleries that have led a multitude of visitors from all over the world in these centuries of cultures in South Africa. The name Mammo Bag is a Sesotho word for place of lights. The community of Alexander Township called their community Mammo Bag after the first team, the first term called Dark City expired. Alexandra Township had no electricity before, and hence the name Dark City. After the government bought in the lights, the community renamed their township to Alexandra Mango Bay, meaning Alexandra, a place of lights. The township is a birthplace of the Mango Bay Township Arts Experience, and a word from the founder and curator. After struggling to exhibit my work earlier in my career, I ended up exhibiting in the streets and homes of my own community. And now, we've created experiences that solve the problems of artists looking for space, families working, looking for work, and townships looking for its place in the world. Join me in my journey of turning townships into towns and exploring new frontiers of my creative career. Sifway and Palesa, Uh Thank you, everybody, for inviting us here to MICA. Uh, my name is Sipiwe Nguenya. Sipiwe, uh, you, basically the easiest way to say it is a C and a P and a W. That's right, you know what I'm saying? So it's a Zulu word, and it means given. Like I was given these flowers. Um, and she's Balisa, and her name means flower too. Yeah. yeah, hi everybody. My name is Balisa Nguenya. Um, as Pew has just mentioned, my name means flower in Sesotho, which is one of the official languages in South Africa. Uh, so my people were from the the country, the kingdom of Lesotho, which is a landlocked country within South Africa. And yeah, so we settled in South Africa. I'm happy to be here. <laughs> yeah, thanks. And I think these mics work, okay, so we okay. can just chill with one mic. Um, basically, I am, uh, I wonder if this works. If it doesn't, I can use this. I'm a illustrator in my spare time. Um, and I like drawing basically people um, who we find in beer halls. So these are like basically spaces for just tremendous amounts of alcohol, you know, dangerous, acidic alcohol that makes people blind. Um, and I draw those people because, you know, they've got the best stories and then they just start drooping from the alcohol. And I redraw them and make them kings with a countenance. And the stories basically come out from the fruits where people can just eat from them, you know. And animals. And animals. Yeah. <laughs> um, so th these are, you know, like this guy is the guy on the left here. And so that's my basic theme when I draw um, in my spare time. Uh, in my spare time, I write. Well, I write all the time, but um, apart from the work that we do at Maboning, I take time to write about self-help. Uh, this is my latest digital resource um, called Boldly Bloom Sis, and I was just playing on poetry and using affirmations to heal, you know, uh, doing that inner work. So, yeah, that's what I do. 
And my name, my pseudonym is uh, Nalongo, which means mother of twins. Uh, that's, that's a title I carry with pride and joy, yeah. Yeah, she, we, we have twins, twin yes. girls. Yeah. Yeah. And this is our continent. We stay right at the top there. Top One, tip. Does this, does this work? Yeah. Oh, there's a pointer. Right here is where we come from. That's South Africa. In that map, it's North Africa. <laughs> um, <laughs> um, but yeah, South Africa is basically the only, it's basically right, right at the top of Africa. Um, and you won't miss it. And Lesotho... Somewhere inside. Yeah, they just didn't, they, they just didn't put it in that map. Nice. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But in terms of context, I think maybe you should uh, help us with right. a bit of context. So, um, as I mentioned, so I was born in Soweto, uh, a famous community from South Africa. Um, it's one of the townships, uh, one of the 2,000 townships that are spread out across the country. And this is just something that we wanted to show you in terms of how uh, the poverty scenario is set up um, as a result of the... Sorry, sorry. Maybe we must just let the guys know what a township is. Are you guys familiar with our term township in South Africa, what it means? Okay. Right. I see heads going like this. This right. is perfect. Thanks. So basically, what you understand as a neighborhood, right, we call it a township in South Africa. So we have about 2,000, that's what she was saying, plus minus 2,000 neighborhoods spread out across um, South Africa. And she's gonna just give a footprint. Right, so the townships are the areas that were designated in apartheid for, for, the, for the majority of the people, the indigenous people were uh, put, allocated in these townships that are outside of the city center, usually on the outskirts, uh, serving as the labor force, that was basically it. And um, this is what's resulted in, in that legacy of, of segregation in, in our country. You can see that uh, the percentage of people living below the poverty line is above 80% in most of these areas. Uh, the, the provinces here represent the different, um, I think you guys would call them districts. So states. states. Oh, states. So they're like provinces, they're areas. Uh, and we have nine of them that are governing the the country. And so this is just to show how people are are living below their their means. Uh, they don't have access to a lot of things. Uh, we have a high unemployment rate, which is one of the reasons why we do tourism the way that we do in our organization. Um, so as I was saying, the majority of people in the country are based in these township communities, which are densely populated. Uh, so as you can see, the brown is, is, is where the black people are living. And then um, the free areas, the greens are more suburban and they are less populated, uh, closer to the means of production and, and cities and the like, uh, whereas the townships are just small spaces that are highly, highly, highly populated. It sort of feels like they look like the buildings, you know, like skyscrapers, you know. It's like the neighborhood should have the skyscrapers because the population is like that and then vice versa, which I like this. And this map, by the way, is from Cape Town. Yeah, this, this right. is Cape Town, which is a popular tourism destination uh, in the country, yet high segregation, like high um, in, what do you call it? Yeah, so it's basically segregated and the basic town plan of it, like there's huge roads that divide neighborhoods, there's huge um, uh, sort of industrial parks that divide uh, living areas based on class, basically. Yeah, yeah. the inequalities are really starkly uh, demonstrated within the landscape in both Cape Town and uh, as well as Johannesburg. And these are the, the areas that we've decided to focus our projects within. In Cape Town, which is where we did our pilot project, and then in, in Johannesburg, which is pretty much the same way as you can see. Uh, 
the densely populated areas are just there out on the outskirts, whereas where it's nice and empty is the suburban areas. Yeah, where the money is. So um, really, why social design for us, especially coming from South Africa? Because you know, South Africa is one of those countries um, with PR that is sort of overdone to the top, especially with Mandela. Everybody loves him, I like him. But the reality is that, you know, 80% of South Africa, the land, specifically the land, still belongs to um, basically the colonizers who came to colonize before. So that's not like a, a story that people hear. And when something like that is like that, 80% of the land is definitely not gonna change very quickly, even if Mandela comes and becomes a president and everybody loves him all over the world. Um, the reality of it is that the starkness is completely deep and the designs of um, the town planning, all of it just shows the power structure that is behind uh, the South African being. You know, um, here you're looking at Hout Bay uh, and Imza Moyetu. Hout Bay is super rich, elite, um, and at the same time it sits next to Imza Moyetu, which you can see, I mean, um, we're looking at different structures, basically, when you see here. I'll act as the red pointer. All of this here gets more dense. You can see, you can't see the spaces even in between the houses. These, they tried to make some sort of organization, but that didn't work out so well. Um, and this type of thought process and design process has been in South Africa for a very long time, where, you know, that's a complex on the left, really expensive houses, and on the right, is again these tin block houses, yeah, with corrugated uh, steel iron. Um, this is another example. So basically what you're looking at here is one neighborhood that's also segregated between class. So it's like class minus zero and class zero, but they're still separated in between this environment and it's still built like that um, even till today, right? Um, so in 2016, South Africa spent 182 billion rands in these townships, right? But you cannot really take money in there and try to fix like just pipes and water and this. You really need to start again or else you'll be spending a lot of money. And basically what has happened is that of the entire budget, only 33 billion is there to build new houses for people, okay? So they're spending the rest of that to try and fix like something that's already unfixable until you start it again, you know? And this is like a sort of a, um, a challenge that we are facing. And then there's like reallocation programs where they try to move people still outside so that they can get their places of living and things like that. So what you are looking at on the green, air, the green dots they basically moved people from the areas which are red, that's where all the money is centered, okay? And they'd move people out from here to like real deep outskirts where they cannot make a living, cannot make any money, um, which also goes towards the thinking of the power structure that's designing the space. Even though it's after 1994, which is when South Africa gained its independence, even though it's still after 1994, the planning is still being planned in the way that was happening before 1994, which is very interesting. So, you know, it also gives to, sh it also goes to show um, who's running things basically, yeah? And that's really an important um, piece of it. Um, but inside all of this, I think challenges do breed solutions and we cannot be like angry young South Africans forever. It's not gonna help with the bladder, the kidney, and just being a healthy young person, you know? Um, maybe you can give us a, a little talk of where we are right now. Right, so um, as uh, Quinton mentioned earlier on, the area that we work in is Alexandra Township. Alexandra is one of the oldest uh, communities in South Africa. It's got a unique history in that the people in Alexandra actually, unlike 
other uh, townships that leased, had like 99 year leases from the government, they have title deeds because the owner of the land split it up and then gave it to the people that worked for him. So that's how the people in Alexandra got to have their land and own it in the richest square mile in Africa, right next door. That's where Alexandra is. This is the view that we have. Um, that area with the skyline is uh, Santon, which is where the stock exchange is. It's the business hub. It's expensive. And they just can't get rid of Alexandra. You know, that's, that's the solution. It's not really to change things, but to move, move, move the problem away. And as people that come from this community, it's, it's, it's up to us to make uh, the solutions that help us to live in a way that is conducive to progress. So it's a, it's a small, it's, it's a fairly small um, area um, that's in the mix of things. Really, uh, it's right in the hub. The people of Alexandra can walk to Sentence. Pure grew up walking up and down uh, to the malls and it's, it's, it's really unique in the sense that it's in the heart of the action. Yet, mm. it, it looks like this. Yeah, and when you see all those trees, Johannesburg is the biggest man-made forest in the world. Okay, so when they were putting all those trees, they just like, in a nice way, forgot to put them in this neighborhood. And as you can count the trees, and they just get smaller and smaller as time basically goes on. Right. And this is another basic view that I also like that shows. So that whole gray that you see there. Tins. Yeah, that's Alexander Township. Okay. Surrounded by all the greenery, um, which is uh, the, 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 the standard uh, look when you look at the suburbs. So it's just trees. And, and then in, in the townships, there are no trees, which is, is a, it's a psychological thing, really. I mean, you can feel it, you know it when you walk in a space that is taken care of, that, that is healthy for you, you know, whereas it's dust. It's just dust and tins. Uh, yeah. yeah. <laughs> so as it's going, it's just going deeper and deeper into what a block looks like. So most of the designs of the townships, they design them like this, with this whole block structure. And um, Alexander Township, like what she's saying, in this neighborhood, it's really the only neighborhood in South Africa where people actually own title deeds for the small pieces of land that are here. And the reason Alexander also looks like this is because they don't, they, the people own the title deeds and not the city, so the city doesn't come with development, right? So what the city has wanted to do is buy all the plots from everybody so it can come with development. And people obviously said no. And it basically stays like this for years and years to come. What you are looking at there is basically um, in, all, in the whole street like this, how you basically access the houses is these like sort of small lines that pass through here, okay? We call those yards, right. yeah? And basically, that is the small line that you've just seen. You know, that's another example of the small line that you've just seen. Inside here alone, maybe you'll get about uh, 12 to 16 families that stay inside this situation right here. Um, they've got one sort of basin right at the top for water. So most of the time it will be flowing down here. And because the municipality doesn't fix anything inside the township, they'll only deal with the road, right? Because then they say, yeah. you know, the people don't own the road. You know, you only own your, your, own, your own property outside, so we'll only do the streets. So if you put dirt in the streets, we'll clean it up type of thing. That doesn't happen so often. Um, and these pictures are really small, but they're just sort of snapshots 
of what this neighborhood that's sort of been left alone, um, you know, it's really, really intense, okay, in terms of population and the amount of people that are there. The fascinating thing about it, though, is that, and I asked my mom, I asked her, I said, who told you that you must build houses and always leave these spaces? Who, who came to you and said you must do that? And she said, no one. So all these things, these houses, just were sort of all sporadic. There was no, another one in 1970, another one in 1982, what, what. But in 2000, what ended up happening is basically this entire structure with all these uh, lines. This community basically organized their own sewage when they bought the land. They organized everything. There was no city involvement inside this township, inside this neighborhood. And I asked her, I said, who then said, you must do this? She says, no, nobody said we must do it. We just all came and everybody was building where they were building. But there was something playing right underneath there, you know? And it was very interesting when every time you go back to the homelands and we realize that, you know what, the people in the neighborhood actually built in the same structure that they used to build in long time ago, which is a sort of genetic type of memory, you know? Um, because it just went where, you know, yes, there is no sort of, you know, it's not like all straight, it's a circle, but the real understanding is that there's a path that goes right in, right in, right in, right in. All of them have the same sort of facility. And, you know, when you learn about this, it's all social security, keeping things inside, you can see each other, a lot of factors in terms of family organization, uh, seeing each other, not necessarily houses next to each other. You know, your neighbor, you see them when you go really outside. You don't just see them, you know, when you're walking across their house, okay? Which is it's a very important uh, custom and practice amongst Africans, basically, you know? And when you look at this, it's completely the same thing. And I grew up here, you know. Um, nobody has ever stolen anything from there. I mean, try it, basically. You know, just try it, you know. And then it's another situation, you know. Um, and then basically, like, what we ended up finding out is that, you know, it also helped to create, like, saving schemes you know, people could like work together and start creating saving schemes and things like that that will help them out in how they do the work that they do on an everyday basis, you know? Um, these, for instance, are runes of the kraal systems. We call them kraals, okay? And these kraal systems, this is like a huge piece of land with lots of kraals that are all interconnected, yeah? And people stay you know, lots, there's a, there's a big family here, big family there, big family there, you know, in all these areas. And what they found when they were excavating these is that they all have a, uh, a gateway that just moves right in the middle of all of them. So you're never sort of outside in that manner, you know. This is another structure, you know. So there's so many of them in the South African landscape. Now they're just sort of buried. You really need to fly there's so many, you know, they didn't, they, they, they like the real, the real ruins, you know. So our personal lesson, and I think maybe you can help yeah. us with this. All right. So um, Maboneng Township Arts Experience began in 2001 after Spiwe uh, was looking for spaces to, to exhibit his work. And... Um, because this was his area that he knew and um, appreciated, he came here after a, a story where he went to the commercial um, galleries that were around and he walked there with his portfolio and they told him they had like a three year waiting list. So he decided, okay, it's cool. I mean, these uh, the pieces that he had done were of the landscape itself. So it made sense to go back to the community and display the works there, exhibit his works there. 
And as he did that, you know, people were really receptive. They had the streets closed with reeds and were enjoying having the streets open to enjoy looking at this young artist's work, you know, and it happened to rain. And the moms, the mamas were like, come bring the work inside, bring the work inside. And the work came inside the houses and the people continued to meander in and out of the houses. And he was like, okay, here's the thing. This looks like a great way for artists to exhibit their works in their communities, making it more accessible. Uh, and so this was an annual arts festival uh, that continued. Uh, on an annual basis, however, people were requesting a more permanent solution, you know, and that's how uh, we ended up just thinking about what what we can do about that. Uh, with the work taking us to so many different communities, uh, it was interesting to then like just take the stories that that work and implement them in the formal thing. This is, if you can. Uh, this is one of our gallery homeowners, you know. Um, we're looking at developing high-impact citizens and our gallery homeowners are our stars. They are our ambassadors. Uh, they enjoy being a part of this, this project. Uh, this is uh, a mama from uh, Guguletu, which is one of the townships that um, we've worked in. And she, this was the first time that she had artworks in her house after her brother, who was an artist, had uh, passed away. He was a struggle icon, and having uh, this, these political pieces was really a connector to her and her, her brother. And th those are the things that we, we like hearing, is, is the relationship that the, art, the, the, the gallery homeowners have and develop with the art and the appreciation that they go through in, in being a part of, of the project that, that we are doing. Right. And um, this was uh, one of my best homes to go in and ask if our project can be a part of uh, their home. And she basically said, yeah, that's fine. Uh, but first, you must see my own stuff. And then she basically pulled out this car battery. And then she took out these wires. And then she connected them on this thing here and there. Then all of a sudden, oh, and she switched off the lights. And then yeah. this thing just came alight. All these flowers here, you know. And that was so important to me because she understood that she was a collector, you know. And what that means is, you know, that's a level of excellence from inside the home where people think these are just people who are poor, who need charity and need donations. But actually, there's a lot of excellence and a lot of self-determination to be a part of culture and to keep culture in your home. Um, and these artworks are prominent South African artist who's painting a, our former president, Jacob Zuma, who everybody didn't like from the African National Congress, which is a political party that sort of uh, took over after colonialism. So, you know, her understanding when we brought these pieces, she told us where to put the artworks. She chose which artworks she wanted. So she was literally a part of the curatorial uh, process. Um, and this is also very interesting. I mean, this small house that you're seeing there was an actual business of one of the ladies that we asked to turn a house into a gallery home. And basically, um, this business was defunct. It wasn't working anymore. And uh, this is an artist, Dolce, from Paris. She came over, and we asked her to basically concentrate just with this uh, mother. And they sat together, talked together, decided what should be on, on the walls. And this woman's business basically uh, started booming in her eyes and concept and understanding of what booming is, right? And I think that's, that's basically what we want to do mm. to the feelings of everybody that even if you had something of your own, that thing can also boom out because that's why we do. We're not doing this because we are the artists. We're doing this because we don't have space. They're agreeing really because they don't have a job and they don't have the culture that they want so much within them, right? And this becomes then a healing process um, 
which is, uh, I would take as a very important uh, sort of alignment to have with people in a community, you know. And just the engagement, you know, the engagement itself, like I was saying, is also the curatorial practice, you know. I mean, we're looking at um, a grandmother here who basically works with recycled plastic. We walked into a house and her, her eyes are really small like this, very, very small. We came in and we asked, we said, can we please, and next to her was her like granddaughter or something. And so we would speak to the granddaughter, the granddaughter would speak to her. Then we said, no, what we are here to do is actually do this, put this artwork, do this, and have you join us in doing this thing. She just opened her eyes. The translator stopped, she had to go, and she started speaking for herself. She opened a, a drawer underneath the television, and she took out all the stuff that she makes. And sold. Keeps on selling, <laughs> right? When we start opening the houses. And I think that's really important, you know? Uh, people like coming, they use, you know, she makes hats, she makes bags, she makes, um, I don't know what you guys call them, but the things you use to put on top of the couch so the hairstyle doesn't go on the material. I don't know, what do you call them? A doily, did you say doily? Yeah, doily, that's what we call them. Yeah, <laughs> it's a definitely a doily. <laughs> so, and there's she on the left, you know, and people just keep on coming to her house, buying what she has, and I think that's really important. Yeah. So, I mean, just like uh, Ukoko that was selling her stuff, I think people, Coco means grandmother, Coco, yes, by the way. Coco, yeah. So it, what we find is that um, people in, 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 in the township communities usually enjoy events, like when there's a time set out for the display and the sharing of work. So collaborations like that, uh, that get everybody out and seeing their communities, seeing their streets, visiting their neighbors again, you know, enjoying the work of, of, of their children. What you see right now is a photography project that uh, we had where the children of, of the street that we were in um, were working with this photographer who would impose uh, what they wanted to be uh, in the future in these pictures. And so then the community and the family and everybody that was around could then see the dreams and aspirations of the children in the community, you know, uh, which which is important for us. It's one of the reasons why we, we do what we do in, in the areas that we are in, just to encourage that thinking that there is there are solutions in the creative arts. You know, we can use the arts to to change things in our communities and impact them in a in a really visible way. Yeah, absolutely. And this is a great sister. Uh, she doesn't exercise often, but when she sees juice and that you can make juice with the bike that you are playing with, she just goes haywire, right? And this is an example of how. We don't only use the homes that we work with uh, and families that we work with. We don't only work with them just in paintings only. You know, we have innovation homes. We have cinema homes. There's homes where we've just like put projectors in so people can go and have like short film screenings from those homes, you know? And what then happens is that it creates this home economy that uh, is relevant, you know? So it's communities basically doing their own type of gentrification, if you can call it that, because they understand um, now that, you know, nobody can just come into the community and then sort of impose, you know, a piece of art on the wall and there's no economic strand from the piece of art back to the home where the artwork is sitting on top of, you know? So it doesn't make sense to have people walking past graffiti routes when the people who are inside those homes are not benefiting from that. Whether from curiosity, whether from knowledge, whether from learning how to sell the arts, distribute the arts, or create the arts, you know? And I think that's really important. Uh, and different people would come and put up their pieces, but we make sure that everything from, from, the, from the, you know, one person basically coming to do a tour really affects um, a lot of people. Maybe you can just help us. With yeah. That. So as I mentioned, um, we started off as an arts organization, 
But as things went on, we realized that, you know what, the art is our product. What we are and what we really want is for people to come and visit and really visit the areas and not be in a bars pointing, having a social safari of some sort, you know. So how we do it is that um, you come through, you buy a ticket on our website, maboning.com, and the proceeds of the tickets pay for the, 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 the people that will be involved, the transportation, the catering, uh, the, the, the homeowners, artists, uh, when, when, when uh, works are sold, get, get a portion of, of, of what's going on. And that's, 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 that's what keeps us going, is, is, is seeing this money stay in the community. You know, we are very intent on, on building businesses in the community so that the money stays within the community. Right. And what, why didn't you talk about this mediation thing? I mean, why did we have to do that? All right, so uh, Spiro was saying earlier on how, you know, when you're going to a space, it's a lot more than the issues that you are seeing. You know, the, the people are going through their own stuff. And um, what we, we, we partnered with a legal firm that was uh, working with the government to bring about justice sooner. There was a back backlog in the justice system and then uh, there's a program on mediation that we were rolling out, helping roll out in, in the community. And in the process, we helped, uh, we helped the, the, the participants to deal with the issues that they have with each other because there are things like street politics, you know, uh, this neighbor block block, block politics block, block multi politics, block you know, politics. Uh, this one's not talking to this one because the child stole their shoes or you know I mean because we have issues of unemployment and disparity and there are there are substances uh, people are uh, are addicted to and so we have social ills that that uh, exist when we are coming into a space so this was a great way to help uh, participants to sort out their issues before so that we can proceed with the building of the community structures and things that would remain. So they all went through basically um, as, a, as a block and you know, they went through a, a mediation workshop that would allow them to mediate in the problems that would come up inside the organizing of experiences or working with artists or working with themselves. And beyond, and beyond, to be honest. Um, for me, that was the, the, the great uh, reward of that, of the, this season, was just seeing the social cohesion. Yes, social cohesion is always a big part. Coming together and changing things in your community together plays a big part in relating together and uh, being more cordial, but this was really important because this community was really facing issues of like really interpersonal uh, things and we needed to work together. And so this was really impactful to see how even beyond people that were not talking to each other were now leaning on each other. So that was really important. And also the houses are so small and the families are so big, everybody's like fighting on who go who's gonna run the legacy, you know, of this conglomerate this huge company that's gonna be left over. And basically that turns out to be like a whole huge thing. And, the, and you know, and our, our thing is based on the home economy. We have to find who is the responsible person inside the home that we would like to work with. And inside that situation, we always find other dynamics. And this really helped to basically gear uh, families to be way beyond the problems of the situation that they're currently in and understand that they're changing the situation to get better relations, you know? And that's really, yeah, that, that really uh, put me in. So we have a, 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 a hashtag, I could say, it's sort of like our motto of turning townships into towns. And we think it's possible, okay? I think it's possible that neighborhoods can basically be stripped of the narrative of crack, of uh, all these things, because these narratives are basically woven deep in the sort of the street, you know, 
So every time when we just give our kids, they get born and they go into these environments, they just get into that same situation. Then you find that it's not necessarily the problem of the person, it's the problem of the narrative that's been stuck on the city, on the township, on the town. You know, and these narratives are so bad that you can't necessarily maneuver in a city which has a narrative of like drugs, you know. People, young people are also gonna start taking drugs just because the story, you know, I mean, um, you know, we came here, remember watching The Wire, you know. Everybody in South Africa thinks Baltimore is made out of crack. The buildings are made out of crack, you know. Uh, the people are corrupt, you know what I'm saying? Everybody thinks this, you know. But that's a bad narrative to go with this space, right? And those narratives are done and made by people who do have power and can have time to make narratives like that until they become an actual action that is done by a young kid, right? So we look more at like social design as the first place to see, investigate, and decipher the story and the myths that are available that people have been leaning on all this time. Throughout all these you know, drug-infested neighborhoods all over the world, what, what are the stories that communities have been leaning on? And then basically using those stories to design around the stories, whether it means breaking down stuff, you know, because then we'd have to be radical. You'd have to be radical to be a self-determined person who decides, and deciding is the key thing, that the neighborhood must not exist at this particular time. And you do whatever you need to to get that situation gone. So what we've always realized also is that the partnership does not only stay in within the community, like you, know, you have to speak to this uncle and that aunt. You know, obviously it grows beyond that. It goes to the municipality. It goes to all the different challenges that we face, uh, people challenges, municipal challenges, um, the environment's challenges, you know. And you know, like I told you about Alexandra Township, if we work there, we can't even get the municipality to come and help us to fix plumbing pipes that are bursting out of water, you know. You have to do that yourself, but you have to have decided you know, that this is what you need to do and this is what you must do, you know. I just, uh, I just wanted to talk a little bit about this concept of townships into towns and how it's morphed. I mean, we've seen it develop and develop. Um, one of the things with the name Maboneng, as you heard, it means place of light, right? Um, and it's a popular, it's a popular name. Yes, uh, Alexandra was the first. After they were Dark City, they were then called Alex Maboneng. But um, Johannesburg is also called Gauteng Maboneng, which means Gauteng, the place of gold the place of gold, the place of light. So um, it happened that as, as the CBD, the, the, the Johannesburg CBD was being uh, refurbished uh, and people coming in and buying buildings and uh, gentrification happening in, an area, in areas, they chose, there was an area that they then chose to call Maboneng Precinct, which is now in the heart of town. Uh, and with all that development, then there, uh, there, there's the marketing that goes towards that. And so we've had our own relationship of, of linking up with the city, with the, with the town aspect of things as the township in a way that is helping us to move closer to our mission of turning the township of Alexandra and others into towns. So. As Pia was saying, that link of of keeping the civic and the big plan in mind, you know, when when we do the work in the in the, in the project areas is, is is quite important. So yeah, but you can carry yeah, on. that's true. It's very true. Um, and then there's this monster guy that we met. Uh, these are the eyes here. And this is his mouth here. And he likes to drool. He doesn't like have any manners. You guys call it decorum. And I mean, he's just, he's just nasty, you know? And he sits basically right 
at the bottom of everything that comes out here. So this monster just takes everything in, you know. These are the one of the lanes that I showed you, which mark what a yard is, yeah? And sometimes these little feet, they get in there and they get stuck. And then this guy comes over and lifts someone out of that thing, okay? This was designed like this by the city because they thought, okay, we can't get in. Okay, let's at least put it around here by the fringe of the yard, okay? Then they put this thing like this and then they just go, basically, right? Um, this is in the richest square mile in Africa, okay? Um, these are the sort of, you know, what happens with the water when they're doing their washing at the back. It just, it just basically makes this river, you know? Um, we opened the monster up, took out his head, and realized that there was, you know, what they made didn't even work. It was just a hole that was just gathering stuff, you know. We took all of this stuff out by ourselves, basically, in understanding that, you know, if we change the spot, we can make money with it. But also, you know, our children, everybody can basically live in the way they want to live, you know. Um, we redid all the plumbing pipes um, and basically aligned them with all the houses because they were just laying the way they want and they're breaking the way they want. So we lined them with the houses so that it basically, for now these pipes were only put after um, 1994, which is after Mandela. So when they put the pipes, they didn't follow the structure that I was showing you of the crawls. They just, you know, put anything anywhere and it was hard for it basically to survive in this environment. So we took them out and basically redesigned it based on the way the crawl that I was showing you is where everybody is looking inside. Um, and then, you know, making sure that it moves with the edges so that when people dig, they don't just hit it anymore. You know, it's by the houses, it's close um, to, the, to the wall itself, you know? And then we got these basins as well and basically put them all over. I'm sure we got like seven for the whole yard. Um, let's see. Yeah. Okay, so this is also one of the basins um, that we'd have to put at the back. And basically close the monster off and give him a beard of cement just to shut his mouth up. And it looks better basically just not to see all that water coming down. People are using their basins, you know what I'm saying? And people can now actually utilize the space the way they'd like to use it, you know? And this is the start, basically. So everybody will just come out. Everybody will choose the colors they like. And we start, you know, it, the real, what we really want to do is take it all up and make it like triple story, like New Orleans, you know what I'm saying? Because it looks good of how they deal with small space. Yeah, as you saw, um, so the community really, the yard, the yard, uh, the yard families came together and decided on what, the the space would look like uh, in collaboration with the artists that uh, we had brought into the project uh, just a, a long consulting process of this is this is what I think I would like outside this is what it would mean we were working with um, ABCs for the for the kids around there are a lot of children within this community so while you're looking at the fun colors let's see what else we can be thinking about. So yeah, uh, it, was, it was really great to have the different families contribute to the design of it. Um, and in the process then able to just connect even deeper, have a, it, 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 it allows such a sense of peace to walk into the yard now. Mm -hmm. um, if you look at this, this compared to what you saw the scene uh, with the monster, this is what it's like in the same yard. Right, and you know, for instance, 
here in this house where this chimpanzee is, um, the fellow who stays in this house, his homeland, where he comes from, like the rural areas, is called literally the place of the monkey, you know? And he just really wanted to keep that as a story that he would join together with a tour guide to tell about his own home, about his background, where he comes from. Um, and so it's sort of like nearly a totem that's, that's on his wall, you know? Um, the, family, the family's also decided that they'd like something that's also like educational for the kids, you know? So they just de decided on working with butterflies, I mean, alphabets and the alphabets that go with the animal or the insect. You know, so in this here, we just wanted to show you um, basically, and I like this line again. I mean, here's this line again. I mean, do you see this line? It's like very stuck, you know, and I still, yeah, it still hits me every time I see it uh, when that happens. Um, and basically, the inner city, this is the inner city. This is the richest square mile in Africa, you know. All of these things are basically around this township, you know. Uh, all these tourists passing here and basically using our township for poverty pimping of some sort, you know. Um, and we just said, no, that's not gonna happen, basically. Um, now, you come here and, you know, in this particular place, we were opening the homes that were to become the, the cinemas, basically. And there's, there's that richest square mile there that's happening there, you know? And if you come to the street, people don't throw papers anymore outside. You know, it's like a real serious thing. Everybody takes it really seriously. Um, each home has got a plaque on it that describes the family, um, you know, the social cohesion that happens. There are people who've stayed literally in Santin, which is 15, 20 minutes away, but have never in their life come to the neighborhood, you know? Um, and that also uh, does something basically to the relationships of people within a city, within a community, how the children grow, how the elders basically relate to each other from the different class differences. Um, it really does a lot uh, also in terms of allowing that sort of connection between visitors, the home, the home economy, and actual artists, you know? Because there's lots of spaces where, you know, only these big artists get to go to and cannot really, you know, um, be accessed by locals in the, in the community, you know? And once the destination is done, we just open it up like a, like a mini type of festival, but it's really a graduation ceremony where the homeowners basically are celebrated because now they have taken ownership of why people come to their neighborhood, what they come to see when they come to the neighborhood, and who they pay when they come to the neighborhood, you know? And now, when people see buses flowing around, they're really very critical of, you know, who are they, are they safe, you know? Uh, why are they in the car? Why aren't they coming out? You know, are we animals? They must come out, let them be a part of what we're doing. So everybody is now very much critical of um, the type of work that happens in within a home and what a home represents. And um, what uh, I think I could say, what visitors represent when they come to, to your space, to your community, you know, that's really important to us. Uh, oh, it's the same. Oh. Right, it's the same thing. Good, good. So, in a sort of closing, I think, a type of closing, um, and don't forget, guys, this is a conversation, okay? I wanted to say this at the beginning. I forgot. <laughs> um, but, you know, there's a whole idea that when you say community, you're talking about poor people, you know? And I think this is a very demeaning idea of what a community is. You know, we are all a community in this room. You know, um, there's different types of communities. That's true, but we are all a community, and we cannot take that word and then sort of put the stigma on it on like a material life, and then 
use that then to demean what it means to be a people together, you know. And so that does definitely mean that, you know, poor does not mean community, but also privilege does not mean forgetting what community is. Because based on the whole idea that the community is now the neighborhood, the community is a place where, you know, even when you hear the adverts, you know, and we do something for the community. And then you, you know, you see like people who don't have anything, you know, being put in this corporate sort of image, which is not right, you know. Um, then it also alienates people who have privilege, who can take part. It takes them out of that discourse. It takes them out of that story, out of that narrative, yeah? Which is that, again, you know, that getting involved means that you're privileged. So it means that anybody from any type of class, as long as they have the power and the decision-making process to be involved in something and take part in something, that's really what's mar what marks a person of a community as a privileged individual. And, you know, you could even make a barometer of some sort of like a, a high impact citizen or high impact global citizen, you know. Uh, Mark Zuckerberg will be a low impact global citizen. And, you know, um, who's the guy that's building his own city? Akon. Akon, you know, he's, you know, I'd say he's a high, you know, he's a high impact global citizen, Mr. Garden Man, you know. And that's, you know, and that's a way that will help us in terms of redefining our own personal narrative and how we fit into the community and then feeling the authority of taking part in changing the community itself because it's not necessarily school that's going to make us like that. It's a personal decision that you have to take to be a person who's going to rebrand the narratives that basically keep on, keep us getting stuck, you know, in, in a borrow, in one place, you know, not traveling, not seeing what's happening, or stuck in a specific mind state and things like that. Um, which then will put us in a space where, you know, just because I'm a designer of any sort does not make me a person who can come and bring the solutions to anybody. You know, for me, it's if I'm designing together with someone or I'm working together with someone to produce something, then that already erases, erases any form of like polarity between the people that we, you are working with or that you want to work with, you know? And I think that's also very important. And in sort of closing, you wanna read this? Yeah. So this is, um, this is a quote that, you know, we, we, we relate to um, regarding some other work that we do that's got to do with emancipation mapping. And we really appreciate this quote that says that more indigenous territory has claimed, has been claimed by maps than by guns. The assertion has its corollary. More indigenous territory can be reclaimed and defended by maps than by guns. You know, this has got to do with the stories that we tell regarding our belonging in spaces, you know, if we if we can tell the stories that relate to what we associate a place to be, we can map that out and then share it as a map that people can navigate when going through the spaces that we are in. And that's 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 what we'd like to leave you with is just to have ownership of the spaces that we are in, no matter how defunct, no matter how progressive. You know, we are able to design together as people uh, and bring change in communities. Yeah. So. And yeah, so there's also a community here called Sowebo. It's Southwest Baltimore. In South Africa, there's also another community called Southwest Township, Soweto, you know. So there are large similarities in terms of communities all over the world and what we face and basically it's a global solution that we have to take part in to make neighborhoods basically the real center of where culture is, where heritage is. Um, and we feel that, that that's the future of how we'll be able to engage with each other. You know, all these families you've seen, you know, some of them haven't gone into the neighbor's house for like two, three years, you know. Um, 
some people have been next to the neighborhood for all their lives and never gone there, you know. So there are a lot of things that can happen with taking part in being self-determined and taking the right that you have and the authority that you have to be a part of building a city, building a neighborhood. And even today, you know, we'll be going to another home um, where there's an exhibition in and there'll be a shuttle outside um, that everybody can take. Uh, I don't know if everybody, but we'll see. Um, so don't run, just step by step, you know, we'll see what happens. But this is the reality of, you know, seeing what we work with in South Africa and seeing the direct similarity right here and being able to share that physically with everybody, yeah? And with that, we'd like to say thank you. And if there's questions or anything right now would be the best time, um, but then Quentin will basically lead us into what we need to do next. So thank you very much, guys. Yes, thank you so very much. Uh, does anybody have a comment or a question? If not, it's also fine. Yeah, I mean, um, we've got our details here. We know how these things sometimes pop up in the middle of the night where you have, ah, so go ahead, um, get in touch, let us know, feedback, you know, whatever. Yeah, and yeah, my winning arts is basically like um, the work of the destination development work and Kinalongo basically is Palisa. Mm -hmm and that's her healing work. Um, I mean, we would have loved to give you our emancipation mapping workshop, which sort of, um, but yeah, yeah, I mean, we'll work on that. Quentin's uh, been a part of our emancipation mapping uh, workshop, and maybe he can tell you a little bit more in yeah. his time. Do you, yeah, come, come up here, Quentin. So what am I doing? No, just talk about the emancipation workshop, mapping workshop. Yeah, okay. All right, so, um, yeah, I did have an opportunity right. to do the... Oh, you got a question? Oh, sorry, Quentin, can you pass the mic to anybody that has a question? Hi, I'm Omolara. Thanks for being here today. Um, I have multiple questions, and you can answer as many of them or as much of them as you feel, or if someone else comes up with a question, you can interrupt mine. So I'm interested, it seems like you started maybe with no funding and then there was a growth of a funding structure because it seems like you started by just approaching people, but I'm interested in understanding how the financial infrastructure that supported your work has developed. Uh, that's one question. And then I'm also interested in um, what the relationship is between this and like internal and external tourism. So is it mostly tourists who are coming from like the CBD or from like other wealthy neighborhoods around Joburg or, you know, people coming in from Cape Town for the, you know, is it internal to South Africa, internal to Johannesburg or is it external, you know, tourists from a, a broader footprint? And then I'm also interested to know, and, and then I'll stop. <laughs> I said three. I know. I'm just giving it's them it's two. You're doing number, number three. three. Lots of questions. We're on three. We're on number three now. Third. Don't feel bad. <laughs> At number three is I'm just interested in the footprint within Mabonang of the project so far. Because I know you showed us the one alley and it seems like it's a connected thing and I'm just interested in how much of the um, space it's expanded to or what your goals are for expansion are. Right, so um, basically, you know, when, when you're working with a lot of people, especially homeowners who are clear that they want to turn their home into a business and they want to be a part of it, then what happens is that the actual investment is happening from inside of all of us. So everybody is literally giving their time. They're giving their goods that are in their houses, electricity, they're plugging in things. So it's also there is that level, and that's the main level of it all even when we don't have any funding, you understand? Um, then the funding model is sort of like, it's very bureaucratic in South Africa, where you're not necessarily going to be able to do everything with the budget that you have. So it's very uh, little. There's, there's, there's sort of ring-fenced companies, like the National City Ballet and all these people who will then get 
the funding every single year. Um, but with a project like this, what happens is it's possible that you don't get any funding for three, four years. And you'd have to be basically outside of a non-profit model, if you can say that. You'd have to operate outside that model so that you can actually make something happen, yeah? Um, so we don't necessarily uh, sort of lean a lot towards funding and stuff. We do lean especially with the investment that we are putting in as everybody because everybody gets paid when somebody buys a ticket, you know? And that's, the, that's basically grown to be a funding model which has been safe for us. You know, we write to reports to ourselves, you know, and they're really important reports. And I tell myself, this is what I did, you know, and that's empowering as well at the same time, yeah. And the people that come, uh, you know, so we've seen that tourism in Africa is being sold like you're coming to the lions, you're coming to the elephants or something, you're coming to the dark continent. This is like a, uh, a theme behind the tourism business that has been basically there for a very long time, you know. There are companies that have been around since like early 1900s that are still taking people to Africa and they're very, very wealthy and they still have the same way they sell Africa, you know, be careful of your camera, you know, we're gonna be in the bus when we're in the neighborhood, you know, you're gonna stay in this fancy place, but we're gonna be outside when you see the rhino, you know, it's like, what? You know, it doesn't really make sense. So they've been selling it in this particular way for a very long time. So what then that has given us uh, is sort of like the vigor to change the PR model to allow the guests from outside of South Africa to see the township and the neighborhood as actually the place where you must start because that's gonna explain to you everything else that you're gonna do from outside. And that's been a hard work to do, but those are the people that you sort of want as well because they have the money to pay for the ticket that's gonna do exactly what you want in the neighborhood. Because if you do it the other way, what happens is that the tourism business has made the tours you take to the neighborhood, like you only pay by giving donations of clothes and this like dumb feature of like, I'm, you know, I'm gonna bring sneakers over, or, you know, I'm gonna, I'm gonna donate some books or something like this, you know, which is very also negative because people don't have a choice. You are making a choice of what book they must get, what sneaker they must wear. It's really demeaning, you know? So we basically had to change the model of even how people access coming to the place, you know? They don't come and access the place by donations. Don't tell us that the, the, the guest is rich and maybe they'll come back and pay for your, for your fees at school or something like this, you know? So it's like a real thing of, okay, there has to be a price and the price has to be relevant. So those people are right. And then we open the destinations for pop-ups. And these are really also good for like the local community who can then access it as they want. Like it's really, it's out there, you know? But what you don't want is just an open freebie situation. Then we're not working, you know what I'm saying? Then we're not making art do what it's supposed to do for us besides the nice things of, you know, having color and feeling good and being inspired, like that whole emotional element, you know? There's other levels where the art continues to, you know, you don't let the artist paint the wall and then you go, you let the artist paint the wall. You teach someone how to talk about that. You place that somewhere so it can be accessed. You know, you design a model for that thing. Then there's like a 360 situation for the artist who then has left, but has then made a, a circle that keeps on going, you know? And I think that's what we're trying to push ourselves to is, yes, the artwork is there, but what's the next level of that situation? And I hope I've sort of, oh, the footprint. So what you just saw was just one yard, okay? So there's like places where it's not a yard, it's just one house, you know? So people will literally take three to five hours going to different places um, that have different content inside them. Uh, yeah. 
Um, so yeah, as, as Pua mentioned, we are, we are moving away from um, the large funding from government and other institutions and focusing more on ticket sales. Uh, another avenue that we are embarking on is um, crowdfunding. We are going the Patreon uh, route of getting our global community, building that that side of things um, for people that can't support us by coming through and getting a, an experience with us. Uh, there's that way, but we're also um, working on products. So those lovely artworks that you saw of spewers, we're putting them on different, uh, we're experimenting with different products that we're making available for for uh, people worldwide to purchase. So just looking at different, um, less stressful <laughs> funding model, you know, um, that's, that's also more sustainable uh, because what we found is that yes, one year or one quarter or you know one period, you get this substantial amount of funding, and then it's dry the next season. You know, so just something that's uh, that's continuous that we can work with. That's 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 what we are looking at. Um, what else? Um, I'm curious about um, environmental wellness and um, specifically the symbol of the trees being eliminated in one part versus the other. Um, I live five minutes out of DC, so trees are also being eliminated very rapidly. And um, how, how are you all working on um, gaining like uh, wellness in a sense of trees producing oxygen? And um, you know, the people with where are the communities where there's less trees literally suffocating and, and getting less of that um, nutrients from nature. Um, so what are you all doing or um, what's in effect um, to um, almost bring that back to life of, of more of, of that like symbol or icon of just something as simple as a tree um, impacting the future and many from that. Thank you so much for that. As a flower, I love where the trees are, you know, and growing up, I mean, this is not just an Alex situation in, you know, in many, in all townships. I mean, when I, when I grew up, trees were sparse, you know, and the ones that were there had been there for long, big, and are being chopped off when just people are like, no, it's just making my yard dirty, you know? So I think it's got to do with um, educating people as well and the importance of, of, of having the trees around because it's just a matter of space. Right now, people are like, look, I don't have space. I, in, in this place where there's a tree, I could have somebody, I could put a some sort of... Uh, a bed. Not even a bed, like a whole, there's a whole rental community happening, backyard rentals. So you could put a structure there and somebody can move in and I could make an income out of it, you know? Uh, not thinking that in, 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 in the long run, more especially, that it's going to be detrimental. So what we've done is uh, a lot of the work that we do is collaborative. So the things that we aren't really specialists in, we will be working with other uh, people and organizations that do um, the, that thing that we're interested in. So with the trees, what we did was we partnered with uh, a couple, I think two organizations. One was a, a prison, a prison organization that was uh, having a planting, planting program where people would come out and plant as a form of rehabilitation. Um, and then there's, there's the other one. I'm not sure about that one. But, um, you know, it's, it's small scale stuff. It's small scale stuff. And then even with the planting of, of the trees, you find that a little, well, it'll be neglected. So for me, I think one of the things that we should look into is the education aspect of like the importance of it and starting with um, the older generation, but also incorporating the youth in, because um, there's a disregard for, for nature and the environment, because it's not something that you're used to, you know? If you, if you live in the community, you go to school there, 
you know, there's nothing you see untoward about that unless you're going out and you're seeing the big jungle around you, you know. So it's got to do with that kind of stuff. I think that's that's where we are looking at is, is the information <laughs> aspect of things. I don't think people are realizing the importance of it. I mean, we've got mind dumps. You know, environmental issues are plenty, are plenty. We've got mind dumps where uh, Soweto in particular is built right next to the mining area. So now that uh, the mining has been concluded, it's just these dumps that are blown over into the community, causing all sort of uh, respiratory uh, diseases. Uh, and hey, it's just how we live, you know. So I mean, there's there's really an educational aspect that needs to go into a lot of the future thinking. Yeah, and also we can't do everything, you know what I mean? It's like it's such a hard thing to be in the t the, uh, any township or any neighborhood where you can see that you can't necessarily do it by yourself or your organization. So what we have adopted is that everybody needs to take responsibility. You know, everybody needs to grow. Everybody needs to know where their feelings are, what their narrative is, and what the future is. It has to be like a community, a full scale thing. And I think it's, it's, a, it's a journey, you know. Um, she told you some of the trees die, you know, because people, if you don't own yourself, you can't own that tree. If you don't own yourself, you can't own the neighborhood and want to fix the little part that you're in, you know. So it's really those types of things, that type of education that comes first, which is really personal. And it's a personal decision to be want to be like that. Again, it's like school is not going to teach you that thing. It's a personal decision. And I think it is a journey where a lot of people are starting step by step to saying, OK, you know what, this is the person I am. These are the things I'm not going to allow anymore. And you know that, that population is growing somehow. You know, That's what I feel. Yeah. I was wondering where you two live, if you live in one of these neighborhoods that you've turned into an, an artist's compound, <laughs> and if it's super colorful, and um, yeah, I'm just curious about that. Yeah, we live in one of the compounds, <laughs> actually. Um, and yeah, you know, and that's in Alexandra Township. And, you know, just to wake up and find all this color around you it does have an effect, you know, to use the space around you as your work has a much bigger effect, you know. So yeah, that's where we stay. We good? That sounds like it's good. <laughs> uh, so what, what are we going to do now, Quentin? How are we going to do it? <laughs> 